are in Virginia's response to COVID-19. I'd like to celebrate some good news and remind all of us the ways that we need to remain vigilant heading into Labor Day this weekend. As always, uh, we start with the health data. It's been a few days since we met, so I will go into a little more depth today. First, let's look at the Commonwealth as a whole. First of all, the total number of cases. As you can see, our statewide case counts dropped through June then rose again in July, driven in part by increased cases in the eastern region. Working together, we were able to reduce this, but as you can see, the trend line has rise slightly over the past week or so, and we will continue to keep an eye on this. This next slide uh, goes over the number of testing encounters, the number of positive testing encounters and percent positivity by lab report date, PCR only, statewide. And as you can see, the blue lines are the number of tests that are reported each day, while the yellow line is the seven-day average of the percent of those tests that are positive. And this next slide, you can see that our testing numbers are generally ranging from 15,000 to 20,000 case or tests per day. Our percent positivity continues to range just below 7%. Again, when all this started a couple of months ago, we were well over 20%. Uh, we'd obviously like to see it lower than 7 but we haven't seen sharp spikes statewide, uh, which is a good thing. Overall, uh, Virginians are doing a good job keeping this curve flat. And remember, we reviewed that in the past of why the importance of keeping the curve flat was, uh, was where it was. Now I'd like to break it down for each of the regions of Virginia. First of all, the northern region total cases. As you can see from the blue lines, new cases in northern Virginia are trending very slightly higher than earlier in the summer and significantly lower than they were early in the pandemic. The seven-day moving average for new cases is around 240. This next slide is the northern region uh, number of tests and percent positivity. So here you can see that northern Virginia's percent positivity is looking steady, hovering around 6%. This next slide is the central region total cases. The central region has not seen a lot of large change in its case counts. The seven-day moving average is around 170 new cases per day. This next slide shows the central region number of tests and percent positivity. The central region, which includes right here in Richmond, saw a drop in percent positivity starting in early August. It now is just over 7%. This next slide is the northwest region of total cases. Similarly, the northwest region hasn't seen huge changes in numbers. That region had around 120 new cases per day. This next slide is the Northeast region test and percent positivity. So the Northwest region's percent positive was under 5% in late July, but that is inching up just a little bit, as you can see from that yellow line. The next slide is the Southwest region of total cases. The the case there, unfortunately, we're seeing cases trending up in that particular area of Virginia. Two months ago, the average new case number was around 80 per day. Now it's more than 220 per day. The number of tests and percent positivity on this next slide, uh, you can see that uh, the percent positivity has actually been increasing. This is especially concerning for a region where there are fewer hospitals, especially with critical care capabilities. This next slide is our eastern region total cases. The eastern region is averaging around 214 new cases a day, uh, which is better than it was in July. And you can see from this next slide that the eastern region's percent positivity has come down from the mid-July spike of around 12%. It's now down under 9% which is still higher than we'd like, but this is certainly moving in a positive direction. 
So I hope you are encouraged by these numbers. Uh, I know that, that I am. The reality, though, uh, is that this virus is still alive and well around the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we have to continue the guidelines and be vigilant. And so overall, the coronavirus is moderately contained in Virginia. The case numbers remain steady, and the percent positivity is not spiking. But again, we continue to watch this very closely, and we need to remain vigilant. We continue monitoring the data, and we need to keep working, especially as our colleges and schools reopen, and especially ahead of a holiday weekend, uh, like I referred to earlier. So we're not going to make any changes before Labor Day. I want to be clear the reason why, and I know there's a lot of folks want to get things back open on Labor Day, but we need to think back to Memorial Day and July the 4th. We saw surges in the week to two weeks following those holidays around the country and certainly also here in Virginia. And we don't want to repeat that as the summer draws to a close. So if we can avoid these same surges after Labor Day, then we'll have a running start as we go into the fall. I believe this, our health team believes this, and Dr. Fauci made the same point yesterday on a call with the nation's governors. With a holiday weekend coming up, with back to school coming in different forms, and with colleges returning, now is the time to double down on what we know is working so we can set ourselves up for success this fall. If the numbers continue to trend in a good direction, and if there's evidence that people are following the safety guidelines over the holiday weekend, we will be able to move Eastern Virginia in line with the rest of the state soon after Labor Day. As we look to the fall, I want everyone to understand that we are headed in the right direction, and it is important to celebrate success, especially during these tough times, and I know that they are tough times. So I want to share with you uh, some good news. First, our exposure notification app is performing well. Virginia launched COVID-wise four weeks ago tomorrow. Since then, more than 460,000 Virginians have downloaded it. That's about 16,000 people per day or 700 an hour. So if you downloaded the app, I say thank you. Many Virginians have already used it to anonymously notify their family, friends, coworkers, and communities. In fact, just yesterday, 51 people received a push notification that they were likely exposed to someone that anonymously reported as COVID-19 positive. We can all be proud that Virginia was first and we got the nation's attention with more than 5,000 stories around the country. This is a great start, but we have to remain vigilant. So if you haven't already done so, please visit covidwise.org. That's C-O-V-I-D-W-I-S-E dot org. You can download it for free on Google Play or in the App Store on your iPhone. Another thing that is working well is our testing throughout Virginia. We took some hits earlier in the year about testing. We've turned things around, as you just saw in the numbers, and we are now averaging 15 to 20,000 tests a day, and those are the, uh, the PCR tests. Uh, so we're moving forward in lots of ways. You know that we joined a purchasing pool with other states, and our state lab just last week began conducting serology testing, also called antibody testing. As you recall from science class, the body produces antibodies to fight off such infections, so this is an important new tool, especially to tell who has been exposed to this in the past. Virginia's public health laboratory plays an important role in our Commonwealth's COVID-19 response, and antibody testing is another tool we can use to not only fight the disease, but to gain a better understanding of how it is Im impacting our citizens. These are all positive steps. Now we have a different challenge. 
we're having testing events and not as many people are showing up. I get it. We're all tired and we all want to get this behind us. But the basic facts remain the same. If you have COVID, you need to isolate yourself and stay away from other people. That starts with getting tested. So I wanted to review uh, this next slide. Uh, this is a map showing all the places that you can get a test over the next few days. They're all over the state, as you can see. When you go there, you'll meet people that you can trust, members of the community, volunteers from our National Guard, your neighbors, people who care about you and your health. It's really important. If you believe you need a test, please get a test, especially if your job requires you to be around other people like teachers. About two weeks ago, the Trump administration reclassified teachers as critical infrastructure workers. This means they could be expected to continue working even if they have been exposed to COVID-19, and that's the wrong thing to do. So Virginia is taking a different approach. If you are a teacher and there's a high chance you've been exposed to COVID-19, you should get tested and stay home until you get the result, even if you don't have symptoms. So let me be clear, despite recent changes in the CDC guidelines, Virginia will continue to encourage that those who need testing get it. That means that if you have symptoms, you think you've been exposed, or you need a test to go back to work, you should consult your physician, period. And again, if you need a test, please get a test. While all of this is going on, I want you to know that the rest of your government is moving forward too. I'm really proud of the work our teams are doing. I'll give you just a few examples. In public safety, we've sent more than a dozen highly trained firefighters to help fight wildfires in Texas, Arizona, and California. In transportation, the Long Bridge Project is advancing and we hope to have more news soon about this important transit option for the East Coast. Those are the rail lines that cross the Potomac River. At DMV, it's still best to renew your driver's license or your vehicle registration online. The offices are reopening and they now have 68 of 75 offices open for appointments. I know lots of people are in line for appointments, so I am extending for an additional 60 days the validity of license and identification credentials that are due to expire by October the 31st. In elections, our teams are preparing for election day. I want to thank the General Assembly for advancing our measures to make it safe and easy to vote this November. Our teams are working very hard and they need your help. Many poll workers are elderly, so they are at high risk for COVID-19. So we're seeing a shortage of poll workers across our state. We need to make up for that shortfall with people who aren't considered as high risk to keep polling places open and operating smoothly. And you can help. You can help Virginians exercise their most basic right as Americans. The Department of Elections is partnering with the Health Department to provide safe and sanitary polling places for voters and our poll workers. If you sign up, you can rest assured that you'll be safe. So please consider working at the polls on Election Day. You can apply at vote.virginia.gov. So that's vote.virginia.gov. Before we turn to your questions, I want to highlight one more success, and it's another thing we need to keep working on as well, and that's our census. The country conducts the census every 10 years, and it's really, really important. It helps determine how much money Virginia gets from the federal government. That's based largely on population, and it determines how much Virginia gets for everything from food security to health to education and more. When you fill out the forms, more money 
comes to Virginia for services we all depend on, and, and that's a good thing. When you don't fill out the forms, you're sending our money literally to our neighboring states. In fact, it's estimated that Virginia will lose $2,000 a year for each person not counted, and that's not good. So here's the good news. Virginia has the seventh highest return rate in the country. We should celebrate that fact, but not until we cross the finish line. And the line just got sooner or closer. The deadline is now September the 30th. The deadline is September the 30th. We have just 30 days to get this done, Virginia. I want you to know there are safe ways to fill out census forms. You can do it online or by mail. Census employees will soon be going door to door in a safe manner to reach households that have not completed their census. Friends, this is really important. So I've asked our team to join me today. So I want to start with our Secretary of the Commonwealth, Kelly Thomason, and she will introduce our guest. Secretary Thomason, welcome. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Thomason. I serve as the Secretary of the Commonwealth, and I'm here today to ask all of you to participate in the 2020 Census. We're asking everyone living in Virginia who has not already completed the Census this year to please take 10 minutes today to respond online or by phone. You can do so by visiting 2020census.gov or by calling 844-330-2020. Now, I know we're here today to talk about COVID-19 and how it's affecting all of our lives. The 2020 census will also affect our lives for the next 10 years. As the governor said, the census is a population count and the census data is used to determine how federal funding is distributed to states and to how many seats we get in Congress. Data is also used by our state and our local communities to shape public safety planning, determine where schools and hospitals are built and more. The results of the census are going to impact our lives for the next 20, I'm sorry, the next 10 years. The census started in March, and I'm pleased to share, as the governor said, that so far over 80% of households in Virginia have been counted, either by self-responding by phone, mail, or online, or by the census staff known as enumerators who have started going door to door to collect responses. Uh, Virginia is doing well in our response rates, and I'm so proud of our progress, but there's still many Virginians who haven't been counted. Each of you is important and needs to be counted. Don't just take my word for it. I'm pleased to be joined today by my Deputy Secretary, Tracy J. DeSager, and several community leaders who are serving on our Virginia Complete Count Commission. Each has given their time over the last year to making sure our hardest to count communities understand the importance of being counted. Tracy? Thank you, Secretary Thomason. First, I'd like to introduce Gaylene Knoyton. Gaylene is the president of the Hampton NAACP and a member of the Virginia African American Advisory Board. Gaylene. Thank you, Deputy Secretary DeZajor. My name is Gaylene Knoyton, and this is a call for action message. There's a lot of fear and distrust of the federal government we can't allow this to stop us from being counted and ensuring that we have fair representation and resources. Census data is used to determine how more than $675 billion in federal funding is allocated. This includes programs such as Medicaid, Medicare Part B, SNAP, WIC, housing vouchers, school lunches, community health centers, Pell Grants, and federal student loans. We can't afford to have Virginians not be counted and lose out on critical funding to support our communities. So please visit 2020census.gov and remember the deadline is September 30th. Next, I'm pleased to have Hun Lee join us. Hun lives in Centerville and is a leader in Virginia's Korean community. Hello, this is Hyun Lee. By law, all census responses are completely confidential and your information cannot be shared with law enforcement or anyone else. Additionally, the census will not ask for your social security number, bank account, 
political affiliation or citizenship status, your responses are protected by law and will only be used for statistical purposes. 버지니아 한인 여러분, 9월 30일까지 센서스 인구 조사에 꼭 참여 부탁드립니다. Thank you, Hyun. Eric Lin of Chesterfield served on the Complete Count Commission for the 2010 census and also has a decade of service on the Virginia Asian Advisory Board. Eric? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Secretary DeShazer. Um, remember, only one form is necessary per household and should include everyone living in the household, including young children, even if they're not, uh, if, even if it's only temporary. Uh, young children are at the highest ri risk of being undercounted in the census. Thank you, Eric. Next, we're joined by Monica Sarmiento. Mar Monica serves as the executive director of the Virginia Coalition for Immigrants' Rights. Monica? Good afternoon, everyone. So the Virginia immigrant community has been one of the hardest hits when it comes to COVID-19. And it is incredibly important for every single individual to go ahead and fill out the census and make sure that their family and friends also fill out the census. Please make sure that not just your community fills it out, but everyone that you know. And please be assured that there's no fear filling out the census. I know there's a lot of distrust on some parts of the federal government, but please be reassured that no census worker can share that information. Nosotros sabemos que la comunidad de nosotros ha sufrido más con el coronavirus, pero sabemos que también llenar el censo es crítico para la próxima década para saber que nuestras comunidades tengan los fondos para las escuelas, los trabajos y todo lo que necesitamos para poder seguir adelante como uno. Es increíblemente importante que no solamente ustedes, pero su familia y sus amigos llenen el censo. Y es muy fácil, solamente toma 10 minutos y esto va a impactar nuestra comunidad por la próxima década. Gracias. Thank you so much to each of you all. The 2020 census is scheduled to conclude at the end of September. We have exactly one month left to make sure that every person in Virginia is counted so that our state and our communities get our fair share of resources and representation. Today, we're kicking off our census month of action to encourage Virginians to take a few minutes and complete their census or if you've already submitted your own responses, please take a few minutes today and reach out to your family, your friends and colleagues and remind them to be counted. Remember, it takes less than 10 minutes to make a positive impact on the next 10 years. It's your representation, it's your community funding and it's your civic duty. Visit 2020census.gov or call 844-330 2020 to complete your census today and follow us at count on virginia for more information on our statewide month of action thank you Governor? thank you deputy secretary and secretary and to our, our guest and uh, i think we all understand the importance of this and i think a couple points that were made that 80 percent of uh, households have have certainly uh, complied and have been filled out, but that leaves us, uh, we have 30 days to, to uh, do the remainder uh, of the 20%. And, and, and also, I, I want to reiterate uh, what we said. Each person that is not counted uh, is about $2,000 $2, $2, a year. And so if you add up the numbers, that's uh, significant. And, uh, you know, the tax money that we have put into the Commonwealth and the federal government, if we have the population, we deserve to have every one of our uh, Virginians counted. So uh, please get out there and, and fill out that census form. I'll close with the same reminder that I started with. Be careful this Labor Day weekend. Large gatherings are still not a good idea. Continue to stay six feet or more away from other people. Wear face coverings and do your socializing outdoors. We don't want to see a spike in cases. Labor Day is a marking point, the end of summer. We have now lived this virus for, lived with this virus for two seasons, and it's still with us. I expect this virus will remain with us through the fall and winter before a safe vaccination is found. And that's why it's so important to stay vigilant, continue to be careful, 
and take care of each other. So thank you all, and I'll be glad to uh, take any questions. Kate. So I'm wondering what specific or specific metrics you're looking at on campuses, and if there's any point you know that you would consider shutting campuses down. It's a great question, Kate. The question is about our colleges and, and universities, and and just as Kate said, we're seeing uh, I think concerning numbers of positive cases at our colleges and universities very early on as as our students have returned to campuses. And just to go back a little bit, Kate, we. We have provided specific guidelines. Uh, the colleges and universities have been working with CHEV. Uh, their plans were certified uh, by CHEV. Um, and we're watching this very closely. And we expect our colleges and universities to continue to follow their plans and also to work with the local health districts. And as long as we see that continuing to happen, uh, then I think we can proceed, but if, if it's not, um, and I certainly have the, uh, the opportunity to, to uh, intervene and, and make changes. We, you know, we've had this discussion, Kate. We, we really want our, our scholars to be back on campuses. We want them to, to be in the classroom, but we really we need to do it safely and responsibly. And so we'll continue to monitor it. Um, I've been in uh, almost daily contact with a lot of our college and university presidents. Uh, we've talked about our concerns uh, on, on each side, and, um, and they're continuing to, to take this very seriously. And, and I, I think that they will continue to make the, the right decisions and, and do what's in the best interest, not only of their students, but also uh, of their, their faculty and, and support staff uh, at the colleges and universities. So we're, we're continuing to monitor it very closely. Sure. You mentioned the importance of teachers, um, yes. and I'm wondering, there's actually a bill in the House right now that would offer paid quarantine leave to anyone working over 20 hours a week in Virginia, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you support that bill. Yeah, I'll give you my answer that I always give, Kate. Uh, these bills are working their way through the legislative process. Uh, uh, there can be a lot of twists and turns, modifications, and so we're, we're following uh, what the General Assembly is doing. And by the way, I, I think they're doing very good work. They're having great discussions, and they're, they're vetting uh, these bills, and there are a lot of them, uh, probably over 200 of them. Um, and so when they get to my desk, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at them, and uh, if I need to tweak them a little bit, uh, I certainly have, the, have that option, and we'll take that liberty. And uh, again, this is about... Uh, for, for all of the above, for you know, moving Virginia forward direction. And I, I really commend the General Assembly that the system that we have in place works very well. And so if and when they get to my desk, I'll take a good look at them. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. You, you mentioned not making any changes prior to Labor Day. Could you talk a little bit about the specific target levels that you're looking for that would help you make a decision to maybe ease some restrictions? And when you say ease restrictions, are you talking about in the Eastern District or in Virginia as a whole? In Virginia as a whole, sir. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. And, you know, right now our positivity rate uh, yesterday was at 7.4. It's it's hovering uh, around seven. Uh, it's obviously been over 20%. It's been down in the, the sixes. And, you know, as I said earlier, this, this virus is, is still out there. It's uh, alive and well. It's very, very contagious. And, and so regarding the Commonwealth as a whole, um, I'm not prepared at this time uh, to make uh, any significant changes. With regard to what's happening in the Eastern District, I commend uh, those cities, uh, and we have been working closely with them. I understand from a business perspective the importance of Labor Day, but we have come too far to go back. And I would just, just emphasize uh, the spikes in cases that we saw after Memorial Day and July the 4th, and we know that we have a lot of tourists that come into uh, Virginia for the Labor Day weekend, and so um, we're being as cautious as we can. Again, if we can keep the numbers down in the communities, then it will allow our schools to reopen sooner, our colleges and universities, and our, our businesses. And so, so that's really the goal of, of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. Governor, you said the virus is moderately contained in Virginia. Can you just 
elaborate a little bit more on that and kind of for the average person what that should mean and, and, and in terms of their guard, should they let it down or not let it down? Well, I appreciate that question, Henry, and, and the message is they should not let their guard down. Um, and it's when I say moderately contained, um, our positivity rate is around 7%. It was higher than 20%. So we're at a more acceptable range, but we're still not close to where we need to be to, to ease these restrictions. And um, I think any time there's a, a large gathering or any time really someone is in, in close contact with an individual that, that has COVID-19, there's a very good chance that they're going to get it. And so in order to be where we need to be in a more comfortable place, people need to continue to be vigilant. I can't say that enough. It's in our hands. It really is. If we follow the guidelines, if we wear our mask when we're around other people, if we wash our hands, keep our hands away from our faces, and keep our social distancing, we can get this virus under control. It can be done, but it's going to take the cooperation uh, of, of everybody. And, you know, Henry, I, um, I, I see the same things that, that you all see uh, around the country, around Virginia, parties, people that say, I don't need to wear a mask, I don't need to follow guidelines, and so I, so I watch that, and I regret that. I really do, because uh, we, could, we could get this under control very easily if we all did the right thing, and that's all I'm asking of Virginians, is to do the right thing. Um, good afternoon, Governor. You uh, touched on this uh, earlier, but the pandemic is now nearly six months old. And they say that hindsight is 2020, and we're in 2020. So, if you had known on March, March 1st what you know today about COVID-19 and the pandemic, what would you have done differently then? That's a great question. Um, you know, we we learn every day uh, from this, and um, so I I think rather than to say, you know, rather than to play Monday morning quarterback and say, well, we should have done this, we should have done that. And I think the historians and the epidemiologists, uh, I think they can certainly uh, make those observations and, and, and make those statements. But I'm, I'm going to take Virginia forward. Uh, I know what we know today. Uh, I know that the, the virus is still very prevalent. It's still very contagious. We know what works. And, and so we'll continue to, to work uh, to make tomorrow a better day than it is today. But, uh, as far as going back and saying we should have done this or that, that's probably for another time. So, uh, as you know, the number of cases of COVID-19 among uh, the Latino and yes. African-American population remain disproportionately high. Has the administration given any more thought to maybe how to mitigate that? And can you tell us about that? Effort? It's a great question, Mel. And this virus, uh, this pandemic has, has obviously affected people of color. Uh, uh, substantially um, and you know we've we've taken a lot of measures uh, we as you know we were up in northern Virginia uh, it's probably been a month and a half ago now but we did our entire uh, conference uh, in in Spanish to, to reach out to those folks we this particular uh, press conference and each press conference we do is in Spanish as well for people that are are listening and I encourage them to pass on the information to their uh, friends neighbors and and family and then the other thing I would really encourage people to pay attention to are the, are the testing uh, sites around Virginia. And, and we have those listed out, and, and I hope we can get those published. But uh, a lot of those are in our Latino communities and, and also other communities of color. And, and so we're, we're really you know, working from a lot of different angles to make sure that we take care of all Virginians. But those are certainly some of the things that we've done and will continue to do. With the progress index. Thank you, Marissa. Governor, I want to follow up on some uh, comments you made earlier in the, in the conference about um, the extent of the pandemic into the winter months. As we all know, the holiday season begins only just a couple months in earnest, and that is always a busy season for travel, get togethers, and what have you. And I know this is going to, your answer is probably going to look more rely on a lot of conjecture and projection, but uh, unlike, obviously, this season is going to be unlike in that we've had before. In analyzing the past and the present metrics of the pandemic in Virginia, are you, what are you and your health advisors expecting to be possibly the trend in the pandemic trajectory 
as we approach that holiday season. And what advice would you give Virginians making plans, long-range plans for, for that season? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, if I had a crystal ball to look into, I could probably answer your question better. But I would encourage families, friends that, that want to get together during the holidays to to take this as seriously as, as they can and, and continue to follow the guidelines and stay away from large gatherings, continue their social distancing, hand washing, uh, et cetera. You know, we've got a real challenge on our hands because not only as we go into the fall months is COVID-19 still with us, but we've got the flu season. So step number one for those of you that are, are listening, and I appreciate you listening, get your flu shot. Uh, and that'll help at least with, with that part of it. We'll continue to, to uh, maintain hope that a, a vaccination comes out for, for COVID-19, but, but that's not with us uh, yet. Uh, we continue to make sure that we stockpile our PPE. Um, that's going well. Uh, we have suppliers, um, and so for our nursing homes, uh, for our hospitals, uh, those are going to be vitally important uh, this fall if we get larger numbers of, of individuals that need to be hospitalized. We're working with our hospital systems, making sure that they have the critical care capabilities, making sure that they have the ventilators, those types of equipment that are going to be so important. But, you know, I, I, I don't have the answer. I, I can't predict how things are going to go. I will say this um, as a physician, perhaps a bit of a silver lining uh, as we go into the fall is that uh, we are all, I think, paying more attention to uh, keeping our hands clean and wearing our face mask. And, and if we can get our flu shots, which again, I highly recommend all of you to do, uh, then perhaps the flu season won't be as impactful as it was in the past. But if we get a bad flu season on top of COVID-19, we're going to have some real challenges. So, uh, again, do everything that you can to, to follow these guidelines. Governor, two questions, if I may. We interviewed uh, Secretary Brian Moran, and after the interview aired, we had a lot of questions about safety within our facilities. As right. Kate mentioned, you know, surges in colleges, but there are still numbers rising in our correctional facilities. And some folks were concerned about Halifax, uh, Sussex 1 and 2, and St. Bride's. Mm -hmm. You know, inmates are, are telling their loved ones they are running out of PPE, they're having to rewash their own masks, mm. lack of sanitizing equipment, wondering if uh, the administration has any thought there. Well, we're certainly aware of the outbreaks. Again, anytime there's a, a dense population, uh, such as in a, a correctional facility, uh, those individuals are at risk. I hadn't heard, Andre, that uh, they're having issues with, with uh, PPE and masks. They're actually making a lot of the masks. So I, maybe we need to tell them to hold back on some of them uh, that, that are, they're uh, distributing. But um, I will make sure that, I, that they have the equipment that they need. Again, as I said, we've done, a, I think, a good job stockpiling uh, our mask and, and PPE. And um, I'll talk to uh, Secretary Moran and his staff and make sure we reach out and talk to the D Department of Corrections and make sure that they have the supplies they need. Because again, uh, we, we care about them and they're, at, at, they're a very vulnerable population. Uh, secondly, there is some circulated information about uh, the, the virus being spread through uh, touching of doorknobs and uh, gas pumps. Is there any, as a doctor, what mm -hmm. do you think about this information and should we move to maybe wearing more gloves? Yeah, it's a great question, Andre. And I, I think the majority of spread uh, is certainly aerosolized. Um, so, uh, for example, sneezing, coughing, uh, you know, close proximity to, to other people. Um, just again, these are just kind of anecdotal things, but um, the cell phone. Uh, we all have cell phones and they're right up by our face. And so I would not recommend sharing your cell phone uh, with other individuals. As far as your question about doorknobs and handles, you know, each day or perhaps several times a day, depending on the traffic uh, that goes through those areas, I would certainly try to sanitize those areas. But, um, you know, we at one point people were bringing their groceries home and, you know, wiping everything down. And I, I think most people would agree uh, that you know, some of that is, is not as necessary because most of the transmission is, is through the air, through aerosolized. Tracy Agnew with the Suffolk News Herald. Tracy? 
All right, we will go to Luann Wright with Roanoke Times. Good afternoon, Governor. You talked a little bit at the beginning about the um, high number of cases in Southwest Virginia and there's particular um, hot spots. Um, are there things that your administration could do to help quell some of the infections that are spreading in these particular areas? Yes, sir. Um, have the health districts asked for anything in particular or something you can deliver to them? Well, I, that, that's a great question. And the question is about the, the kind of the increased uh, rate of uh, infection in, in some areas of Virginia, and specifically this question I ask about the, the Southwest. So you know, I think the, the first step is to continue to provide accurate and updated information, uh, and that happens through our, our local health districts. Uh, I think it's also important to to know that uh, when there are hot spots in, in Virginia, we are uh, paying particular attention to those areas, enforcing the guidelines that we have put forward, and, and so visits are being made to uh, restaurants, bars, et cetera, uh, so, so that's important. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the main concern we have, especially in rural Virginia, is our, our the, the lack of the ICU capabilities uh, in those areas. And so we, we have to be very vigilant and we will continue to watch those areas uh, as close as we can. Yeah, switch gears here and to ask you about another bill coming up in the special session. A couple of Democrats supported a bill that would make the votes of the parole board public. Should those votes be public in your opinion and will you sign it if it gets to your desk? Yeah, again, Jackie, there, those, uh, there's a whole lot of bills that are making their way through the, the General Assembly. Obviously, as, as we've talked about before, transparency uh, is important, uh, but there are reasons uh, that are there are laws that are you know part of our code and so I, I'll continue to monitor those and uh, we have a, a policy team that is working very closely uh, with our legislators and, and you know like I said if and when those bills get to my desk I'll I'll make a decision at that time it's just so much can change and there's haven't been in the Senate for six years and as lieutenant for four years uh, and I'm sure you've read some of these bills but there are a lot of uh, can be a lot of variations and, and changes and so to say whether you support something or don't at this stage is probably a little bit premature. Do you have any direct concerns about making them public that you could share? Well, again, uh, it's a it's a complicated situation, and um, there are reasons that some of these things are, are kept confidential, and um, and the legislature is is well aware of of why some things are good and why some things aren't. And again, I'm I'm going to let those those pieces of legislation. Uh, work their way through and we'll, we'll deal with them if they get to my desk. Governor, you mentioned earlier extending the driver's license uh, that expire. Could you provide a little more detail on that and why that's important to do at this point? Do we have anybody from DMV here that can? Yes, yep. Please come forward. That's <laughs> Thank you. It's time to phone a friend. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Linda Ford, Assistant Commissioner for DMV. Um, we are working hard. We have almost all of our offices open at this point, um, all but three offices. They are open for appointment only, as um, you all know. Um, we've got about 10,000 appointments a day, and so we're actively working with folks. Um, we do have a lot of individuals who need um, driver's license renewals, and so we're focusing strongly on them. We have um, recently changed our appointment scheduling system to allow Tuesdays and Thursdays to be solely devoted to driver transactions. Um, we've got, um, with the extension, we've got about 275,000, I believe, um, <clears throat> uh, customers who will be able to do, uh, have this 60-day extension. It's either a 60-day extension for August, <clears throat> excuse me, August, September, and October renewals. They'll get an additional 60 days, and the November folks will have till the end of November. So well, if your license expires during those three months, then you get the 60-day extension, the three that you just mentioned. Correct. If your original um, expiration was in August through November. Mm-hmm.
Hey, Governor, uh, you you mentioned that uh, our cases are, are starting to trend up again. Uh, and I'm curious whether uh, you have any insight as to what you think might be, be causing that upward trend after uh, quite a while of cases going down. And also, uh, hospitalizations and deaths are down, uh, but we haven't been able to, to keep deaths at zero. Um, I, I don't know if we maybe one or two days since this began. Um, what is making this virus so uh, especially dangerous here in Virginia, do you think? Well, thank you for your question. And I, I don't know if I'd say it's especially dangerous in Virginia. I mean, it's, a, it's the same virus throughout the world, uh, literally. But um, as you said, we've seen, to see a, we've seen a little bit of an upward trend uh, in Northern Virginia. The positivity rate is, is still low uh, compared to the uh, state average. Uh, but uh, your question is, why is this happening? Uh, and a couple of things I would say. One is we know that the instance, uh, the contracting of the, the virus is being seen in younger individuals now, especially in the age of 20 through 29. And this obviously is from social gatherings, uh, whether it be in restaurant, bars, college campuses, whatever. And so, again, my message is to, to continue to, to reach out uh, to those individuals and and please you know abide by these guidelines and and uh, keep those numbers down so uh, that's one thing the second part and you mentioned deaths and every death is uh, a death that we don't want to have happen and so we we take those seriously and and while we see high numbers uh, the death rate has gotten lower and the reason for that is because the increased number of cases is in younger people, and they're not affected as significantly. And so they're, we're not seeing as many hospitalizations, certainly not seeing as many people in the ICU and in need of ventilators, and we're seeing less deaths. But there's still, uh, there still are deaths, uh, which is unfortunate, and, and that just speaks to, the, uh, to what we already know, that this is a dangerous virus, and uh, when certain individuals contract the virus, whether they be elderly or whether they have other underlying medical conditions, uh, they are at a tremendous risk to, to have a poor outcome. And so, um, so the message again is that, you know, if you're young and invincible, uh, think about the person that's not in your situation. And that may be a healthcare worker, it may be someone in a nursing home, it may be someone in your family and so so you know always consider other folks and and that's why we're all in this together we all need to be part of the solution and if we we take that attitude we can get this health care crisis uh, behind us in the rearview mirror yes good so uh, thank you all um, for being with us again uh, I saw some of you a little earlier today out in the rain at least we're indoors now so that's that's a good thing but um, I, I really appreciate the uh, the media and the press being here, as, uh, again, it is so, so important for all of Virginians to have accurate and, and updated information, and so I commend you for the work that you're doing. And to, to all Virginians, I, I hope that you all have a safe and, and peaceful Labor Day weekend. It is the uh, end of the summer officially, the beginning of fall, um, and so stay safe, stay healthy, take care of your families, and take care of each other, and we'll get through this together. So thank you all very much.